Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It really is a good morning. It really is. I love just being in the presence of God. I love being with you guys and in church together. There really is nothing like it for me. It, it really is. And this is speaking as someone who grew up in the church who really did not like going to church on a Sunday morning. Uh, growing up, I'm not even pretending I did. <laughs> um, but something shifts when you see the value of coming together. When you see the value of actually, I come to church not just for me. Oh gosh, I could have gone a whole other preach here. You're not here for you. Let, all right, <laughs> let's try this. You're not here for you. Someone needs what God has put inside of you. It may be someone in this room. It may be your family members, your neighbors. It could be, it's the world. But it's in the place of gathering together as a body for not forsaking the unity, to come together, to worship together, to, to learn together, to press in together. You're getting formed. You're getting molded. You're, getting, you're receiving a downpour into you so that when you go out Monday to Saturday, you can be the best version of you. That's the reality of why we come together. Now, in that place, absolutely, come and get refreshed. Absolutely, come and receive. Come and get ministry, all those kind of things. But if we have a, I go to church if I feel like it, and I'll, I'll not go if I don't feel like it, and we have that kind of attitude towards church, we're missing the point of family. You showing up for a Sunday dinner with your family isn't just about you. It's blessing your brothers and sisters. It's seeing your grandkids. It's you being there, present, bringing the best of yourself there. Anyway, I am completely off topic. That's just for free. So grab your Bibles. Um, we've been on our series on prayer at the moment. And um, I've got, I, I kind of decided that this would be my last week on this. And then I started prepping my message and I decided I'm not done. Um, so <laughs> we're going to carry on for a, for a lot long because there's just so much to unpack in this area. There's just so many different facets. And for those who like the titles, um, I want to talk about unbelief this morning. The seed of unbelief. And I'll explain what I mean in a second. But um, our main passage today will actually be in Mark 9. We'll turn there in a minute. But I first want to show you something in Matthew 13. Um, so if you have your Bibles ready in Matthew 13. And before I read... Um, this passage. This is the, the parable of the seed and the soil. And um, I, I've shared on this before, and it's, I just want to clarify really quick so everyone's on the same page. The, the, in this parable, excuse me, the seed is the word of God, and the soil is our heart, okay? And Jesus is talking about the fact that we need to understand that his words are constantly being sown, but the soil isn't always ready to receive, and there's something in, there's, there's just a small part here. Matthew 13, and I just want to read verse 22. I normally don't like taking one verse out of context, but it ties into what we'll do in a minute. So Matthew 13, verse 22 says, The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. The condition of the soil will determine the fruitfulness of the seed. It's actually the condition of the soil that determines the fruitfulness of the seed. But we often judge the seed rather than look at the soil. And we judge the word, either the written word or the the word that was spoken to us or the word that God is trying to speak to us. And we kind of we have this judgment aspect towards the word when actually we need to be looking at the soil because the soil determines the fruitfulness. Before I move on, I need, to, I need you to get this. So I'm, I'm, you don't need to turn here, but it's Matthew 7, verse 18 says, A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Now, this is speaking about being aware of false prophets. But here's the thing. That, that end phrase there, therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. 
I find that so often we've, we've kind of misassociated it and put it into this phrase instead, well, I'll know if it, it's God based on the fruit. Not always. Not always. Now, do our lives bear the fruit of how the condition of the tree? Absolutely. But we can't impose that on God. Let me just pray real quick. Thinking hats. Thinking hats for everyone. Openness to thinking hats. I, I just want to challenge some thoughts this morning. Because we have this idea sometimes that I'll know if it's God based on what the fruit is. But that's not always the case. Let me illustrate. Okay, I want you to understand this. Was Jesus teaching not good because Judas' heart stayed greedy? Was the teaching the problem? Was the word the problem? Or was it Judas' heart? Was it the soil? Let me give you another example here. Jesus, in uh, Luke 17, Jesus healed 10 lepers. But only one of them had a character change to the point that he came back to give thanks. So were the other nine falsely healed? Was the word the problem? Or is the soil the issue? See, so often we, we, we judge words and understand the, the, the seed. We judge the seed, but we don't actually take account for the soil and for what else is happening inside the heart. What deceitfulness is in there? What worries are in there? What fears are in there? And the reality of what I want to talk about is this. You can have a garden with good seed, but if you don't continually maintain it, other seeds will grow. And they will snuff out the good seed. You can have an amazing prayer life, but if it isn't actually, if you're not maintaining the soil of your heart, those prayers get snuffed out. They'll compete. Seeds compete for nutrients. It doesn't matter which, if it's a good seed or a bad seed, if it's a rose or if it's a weed, it's still competing for the same things. And our job, the, the importance is to understand what's happening inside. Are you following? Okay. Romans 10, uh, yeah, Romans 10, 17. R faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Yeah? All right, let's say it together one time because I need you to grasp this one. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let's try this one more time. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Not faith comes by hearing the word of God. Because otherwise, I'll just put on YouTube, listen to preachers all day long, and I'm Smith Wigglesworth. It doesn't happen though, right? I would love that. If all I have to do is listen to... Smith Wigglesworth online, and suddenly I get up and I've got the same faith that Smith Wigglesworth walked with, or whoever your hero is. That would be wonderful, but that's not actually what takes place. That's not how the kingdom works. Faith comes from hearing. It's your connection to the voice of God that creates faith. Now, where do we find that? We've done this whole series. You can guess by the title of the series. Where do you discover the voice of God? In, starts with a P, prayer. <laughs> I'm going to make sure you're following this one. <laughs> you're all right. It happens in prayer because prayer, as we've discussed, is the relational aspect between us and our Father. I get to recognize his voice because I'm in connection with him. We've shared this, and I, I, if anything out of all this series, I want you to get this principle I shared weeks ago. Prayer is stepping onto the potter's wheel. It's not approaching a vending machine. I approach God in prayer to be molded into the answer. I don't come and tell him what I want him to do for me. So faith comes from hearing. It's the relational aspect that develops that. But the voice of God is activated by your exposure to the word. Why do we have such a value for the Word of God? Because it's in the Word of God and it's in the, the written Word, the Logos and the Rhema, Him speaking to us now, that we are exposed to know what His voice sounds like. And it's in that place that our faith is developed. That when the seed lands, it actually can take root. I want to say it a different way here. The Word enhances and trains my hearing. 
I'll try it on this side. The word enhances and trains my hearing. And it's when I hear that my faith is developed. And I don't get to judge the fruit based on what I see or what, based on my experience. I don't go, oh, judge God for his word. No, if the fruit's not good, I need to check the soil. I don't get to say, well, maybe God didn't really mean it. Or maybe it's not fully true because I don't see it the way I want to see it. No, his word is always true. It's a living word. It's true forever and eternity. Whatever word you want to throw in there, it is always true. The soil of my heart needs to be maintained. Here's the challenge. The word enhances and trains my hearing. The challenge is I have the word God spoke to me. But I've also got the criticisms. I've got the fears. I've got the self-doubt. I've got the rejection. I've got the pride. Complaints, you name it. No one's an island. No one has nothing happening in their day-to-day. And if every single thing that happens to you into your day-to-day is good, perfect, and holy, you're in heaven. (laughs) It ain't happening down here. We do our best to create that culture. But even in church, I'm sorry to say, not everything's perfect. I know. It's crazy. Church isn't perfect. Oh, gosh. I do tell Carla that we need to get better, you know, but it's a joke. I'm checking you're alive with me today. Come on. So, look, I've got all these things competing for the same soil. This is what I want to talk about because the seeds are there. This passage in, in Matthew 13, the, the parable is, is so key. The words are so key. It's the seed being sown. But it says here in verse 22 that the worries are there. How does it word it? Let me reread it here. The worries of this life and deceit and the fullness will choke it out. Other versions call it thorns and weeds. Well, they have their seeds too. These aren't things coming down and picking it up. They're things that are in the same ground as as the seed of God's word being thrown onto our heart. So we're here this morning, okay? Let's do this. This It's practical. We're here this morning. We're receiving the word of God. We're in worship together. We're reading the living word of God. I'm sharing the word of God. This is seed being thrown onto you. But if you have a bad attitude, if you're frustrated this morning, if you're envious of whoever's on the stage, if you're self-criticizing, if you're in whatever, you had a really bad ride over with your spouse, whatever it may be, and you're not watching those things, I could preach the best message you have ever heard. It doesn't mean the seed will take root. And that is not on me. Nor is it on God. That's on you. That's not a shame thing. This isn't a crit- It's a reality that you can sit under the greatest teaching. Judas was with Jesus Christ himself, but his heart didn't change. It doesn't, you can have, you know, so actually I want to encourage parents for a second. This is a bit different, but you can teach your, pa- your kids the best things and it's your job to do that and create an environment and preach and, and share the word with them. You cannot control their heart. And I think you need to be released of that. And I think that's for spouses as well. We need to be released of this belief that actually the the fruit that might come out of their lives is on you. It's not. It's not. Keep praying. Keep ministering. Keep loving. Keep showing grace. Make sure you're anchored in here. Deal with whatever roots are happening inside of you (laughs) so it doesn't turn to bitterness. But it is not on you. We talk about this a lot. You cannot work harder at someone else than they're willing to work at themselves. That doesn't mean I don't love you. That doesn't mean that I'm keeping you at arm's length. I'm speaking as a pastor right now. I cannot, I can't look at my church and go, if there's not perfect fruit everywhere, it's my fault. I I will fail. (laughs) It's just real. If that's the standard I put for myself, but it's the same in you in your life. Miss to your heart first. Okay. 
Turn to Mark 9, please. Mark 9, verse 17. Mark 9, verse 17. We're going to read a bit of passage here, and uh, I'm going to stop along the way as we go. All right. Starting with verse 17. A man in the crowd said, Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit, that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Verse 19. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring me the boy. Let me just stop there for a second, because I know different versions say different things, and I want to just draw this really quickly. Unbelieving is correct. Faithless is not the correct translation from the Greek. And some of you might have faithless, and it doesn't mean I don't love all of the rest but of that version. But the correct word, and we'll talk about it in a few minutes, is unbelieving. There is a difference between faithless and unbelief. Unbelief is not the absence of faith. It's the presence of unbelief. Okay, I'll try over here. Unbelief is not the absence of faith. It's the presence of unbelief. Unbelief is a seed of its own. It doesn't mean that faith cannot be found. It means that unbelief is present. So Jesus says to them, O unbelieving generation. Verse 20. So they brought him, so they brought him, this, the boy. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Why would the spirit do that in front of Jesus? Why would the spirit do that in front of Jesus? Now, what I'm about to share is my opinion, okay? I propose that it's because it worked on the disciples. It's why I propose. The reason that the the demon manifested in that way is because it worked on the disciples. Why do I propose that? Because if the devil can create enough disturbance with what we see in the natural, it can affect what we see in the spirit. If the devil can get your attention and confuse you and create enough disturbance around you with what you can see with your eyes, it can affect what you actually are seeing in your spirit. And can affect the seed that actually God has planted and the faith he wants you to engage into a situation. He wants to create enough commotion. Because as soon as there's enough commotion, what happens for a lot of us is we see it with our eyes and it affects our hearts. So if the devil can, can find a way to intimidate you, because he can't really harm you, but he can intimidate you. And he wants you to partner with what he's doing it becomes a lot harder to have that stance of, oh, wait, these are the disciples. Let me just give some context here. At this time, these disciples are the most skilled, trained, equipped demon caster out as there are. Like, that's, that's the reality. But yet, they encountered something that for the first time, at least recorded, they, could, they didn't know how to handle. So Jesus says, let me show you how it's done. <laughs> so the, and the de devil does this. F look, I want to stress this because it's important to understand. Faith does not deny an, a problem's existence. It just doesn't allow it a place of influence. If we walk as a faithless, uh, uh, faith-filled people, sorry, I'm not. We're not there to deny that there are problems. We just don't let it affect our behavior. It doesn't get to dictate how I respond. The issue is when you walk in unbelief. When unbelief 
gets hold of your heart and worries and fears, it starts to affect how you respond and faith gets snuffed out because there's multiple things competing for the soil of your heart. All right, verse 22. <clears throat> oh, sorry, verse uh, 21. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. He's often thrown him into fire and water to, to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can do anything. I, I, I'll be honest. I think a lot of us pray that way to God still. God, if you're even able... Like, it's the lowest register of faith there possibly is. I can't actually imagine something lower. I don't even know if it moves the needle of faith. But I'm like, if you can do anything. You're speaking to Jesus Christ. And you're like, if you can. It's the smallest level of faith. I don't know. But I think often some of us have that heart posture still. God, this is my problem. If you can do anything. What was Jesus' response? It's brutal, but I love it. If you can, Jesus said. He calls him out for this unbelief. If, I, if you can, if I, Jesus said, everything is possible for him who believes. Verse 24, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. Help me overcome my unbelief. What is he saying? I've got more than one seed growing in my garden. This is why I said at the beginning that unbelieving is correct. Because unbelief does not deny the existence of faith also in the heart. The issue was, this father said of himself, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. There's something else also in my heart. There's something also competing for where my faith lies. Where's the needle going to go? Let me just finish this passage. We'll jump back on this in a second. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. Verse 28, after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind come, come out by, only by prayer and fasting. I'll come back to this in a minute. There's quite a lot that I want to unpack in this passage of principles. Um. We, I have a, uh, a tall pot, plant pot. I'm not a big gardener person, so apologies if this is the wrong terminology. But on our patio in our backyard, we've got a tall plant pot um, that has a plant in it. I have absolutely no idea what plant it is. Um, I'm sorry, John. He's just shaking his head, the gardener in the room. I'm just like, I'm sorry. But we've got that there. Anyway, we've got this plant that's growing in it. And I noticed the other day, because obviously it's July, so it's been raining. No one? No? Okay, gosh, you're awake. <laughs> uh, it's been raining a lot, if you haven't noticed. So I w we went outside the other day, and we noticed that there were weeds growing in the same soil as this pot. Which is confusing to me for a second. But we also have um, synthetic grass, fake grass. It was there before we moved in. Um, and I, I was looking at the end of the garden, and I noticed that weeds were coming through it. And I was like, what? So I kind of peeled it back, and, and there's soil still underneath. Even though everything's been removed, weeds haven't fully been removed, and all they needed was a bit of water, and here they are. And they're actually poking holes through the fake grass we have on. And I have no idea how come they're there. You'll understand my point in a second. I, I, I have no idea why they're there. Like, I didn't plant them. I don't know how the weeds got into the soil of the pot. It's not even at the ground level. It's high up, and it's only got a plant. Like, why are weeds growing in there? I don't know how they got there, but they're there. Here's the principle. 
The water of God's presence waters all seeds. I'll try it out here. The water of God's presence waters all seeds. Whatever seed is planted will manifest itself in the presence of God. It's an important principle because I really wish I knew how to have a watering system or a watering can that only watered flowers. Gosh, I'd be a millionaire in seconds. If you could figure out a way to water a, water be- uh, um, a garden bed and only your flowers grew, it'd be wonderful, right? Well, what happens? You start watering it or it starts to rain and you discover it doesn't matter how much brick you've put on there. It doesn't matter if you've got fake grass on top. It doesn't matter if you've tried to elevate it. Weeds find a way. They are so persistent. It's ridiculous. We were doing some work on this garden here and um, in in this building, and we're discovering weeds everywhere. And we're removing them, and they're growing twice as fast. I don't know how it works, but they're constantly there. And you can try all kinds of things. The reality is you just have to maintain it. You actually, there is no permanent solution. You just have to maintain the soil. Because the water of God's presence, I'm going to say it again, waters all seeds. Whatever is in your heart, whatever seed is there, it will become manifest. It's a kingdom principle. And what happens is when God exposes the seeds that are trying to take root, I have an option right there to take quick, short accounts of myself to deal with it in repentance and fully so it doesn't set root. I wish I could tell you that only good stuff grows. It doesn't. And what I find is that actually the offenses, the pains, the self-doubt, the hurts, their roots seem to grow a lot faster than the positive things in our lives. They seem to be harder to pluck out if you leave them for a long time. Not impossible. And the important part is this. God gives us a grace. When something manifests in your heart, let's say you're driving down the street and you just have this anger moment because someone cuts you off. Right there, there's a quick moment There's a grace on that moment. You can go, oh, it was just a moment. Or you can go, wait, that's a grace from God to recognize there is something that's not of him still there. And you have a choice in that moment to take hold of that thing. Deal with it fully and thoroughly in repentance before God. Repentance, we've said this many times, is not a taboo word. It is an act of love that God allows us to even repent that he actually allows us to turn away from our mistakes and turn back to him is a a gift of God. We need to act. Daily repentance. I'm not just saying a random blanket, oh God, I repent of everything I did wrong today. No, take short accounts. Recognize what roots are there because if they go down deep, they start to affect your personality. Positive or negative. They will affect who you are. They'll affect how you lead. They'll affect how you do marriage. They'll affect how you parent. They'll affect how you do business. They'll affect every area of your life. Wisdom recognizes when the Lord is bringing something to the surface. He's letting you know there's something there and you've got a choice right now. Are you going to deal with it or pretend it's not there? I pulled out. I, I was, it was raining, surprise, and it was cold. And I saw the weeds at the back of the garden that were underneath the fake grass we've got. And I just did a quick pull job. I know I didn't deal with the roots. Like, let's be very honest, but I know I did not deal with it. But it was satisfactory for me, so I couldn't see it. Oh, guys, you need to get that. This is important. So often we deal with things so we feel they're satisfactory because we can't see them for a couple of weeks. But it's getting, the roots are getting deeper. I can pull that top part off as much as I want. That root is getting harder. And if one day I want to go, actually, I need to deal with this, I'm going to have to get on my knees, 
pull this thing up and get some tools. Thank the Lord that he gives us techniques and ways and people around us to help us break through in areas of our lives that roots are deep. And we go in there and we got, I got to work at that thing. But a lot of us just live on the superficial, if I just pull it out real quick. Guys, I'm, I'm not proud of this, but the little green weeds that were happening in the little pot, I just turned the soil over. <laughs> That's, I'm just being really honest. My mom was coming to town, and she's like big on gardening. It's like the one plant we got going. I was like, she sees weeds in this. I'm never going to hear the end of it. And I was like, ah, got other stuff to do. No, this is true. God spoke to me so hard on this because I literally just went, oh, ground. Oh, there you go. They're just hiding underneath. <laughs> They're still there. They're coming back. And they're probably coming back in strength. This is the reality of our lives. We don't deal with stuff. And then we, we end up hitting a wall. And we're like, I don't know why I'm, I've hit this wall. Because we've turned over the soil so many times. There's, only, there's nowhere else. Because the plant, why isn't the plant growing? Because actually, every time you water it, th there's more weeds than there is that one good seed, and that, that seed is not getting the nourishment it needs. There's so many things happening in our hearts that if we don't take care of them, if we don't come in prayer to be molded for God to bring stuff to the surface and to go, ah, God, I'm sorry that I've allowed that for too long. I'm sorry that I haven't dealt with that. Thank you for your grace for me to deal with this right now. I got to get that thing out and I need to get the roots. Not just the surface. Not just so it looks like I'm a good Christian on a Sunday morning and then I feel absolutely terrible Monday through Saturday and I don't know why. But you do know why. Roots are killing you. The, the weeds are killing you. We have all kinds of things in our gardens. I do. Now, my, my, our personal jobs is to make sure that it's the seed of the word of God that I keep on getting filled with. But that doesn't always happen. Look, I'm using this illustration because I need to draw this point. This pot, how did the weeds get there? I know how it happened. Our neighbor has this tree with little flowers, and it blew over, and it landed. And then from the top of our roof, there's little things that land on there, and they just make their way down. It wasn't, I didn't plant them. It just happens. Because I live with an environment around me. You might be sat here and go, well, no, I've dealt with this, and I've dealt with that, and I've dealt with this, and I'm like, this... The things that might be in your heart, the seeds that might be competing for the soil might have nothing to do with you directly. It may have been the house you grew up in. It might be the work environment you're in. It might be the offense that other people are trying to put onto you. That's why we've talked about gossip and not entering into those. Zones that we, ha we, we don't, you can't just go, well, you know what? I'm going to build a big offense so nothing comes over. That's not living. There are things sometimes that just happen to us, but we need to deal with what, what the out, outflow, that's the wrong word, outcome of them, that's the word I'm looking for. Okay. So in response to this, I find that a lot, a lot of the time, we either believe or we've been taught that the, the answer to this is bigger faith. My response is, there's stuff happening, there's, there's bad soil, um, so the soil's fine, but there's weeds in there, there's other seeds in there, I just need bigger faith. I need to, it needs to be big, and, and that will deal, it'll over, like, overcompensate, and, get, and, and then I won't even see the weeds that are taking place. The reality is that Jesus actually canceled out the concept of faith size. And I want to show you this, Matthew 17 uh, if you turn in Matthew 17, verse 19, it's the same story as the healing of the boy here. But in the Matthew version, there's a little bit ad added on at the end. Um, I want to read from the New King James for, uh, for a reason. I'll explain it in a second. <clears throat> verse 19, Matthew 17, verse 19 says, Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not ca cast it out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. 
For assuredly, I say to you, if you have a faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Okay. How many of you in your Bible version, again, they're not bad, say little faith or faithless? Okay. A lot of versions do, not all. It's always bothered me, that, that translation. So I went into the Greek. And it's important because I need to explain. This isn't just John's opinion. So the Greek word here used is apistia, which means unbelief. Because of your unbelief. Now, the Greek word for littleness, so little faith or lack of faith, is the Greek word oligopistia. But that's not the word used in this passage. The word used is apistia, which means unbelief. And it's used in different passages throughout the New Testament in the Greek. Why does that matter so much to me? Why am I making a point on this? Because if you go down the road of saying that Jesus said to them, it's because of your little faith, right? But if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed possible, you can move a mountain. So are we trying to say that Jesus was saying that your faith is even smaller than the size of a mustard seed? Was he saying that to the disciples who he just sent out 12? It was so successful that he added another 70, and they, came, and they were casting out demons and healing the sick, and, and all kinds of crazy stuff was happening. But the first time that it's on record that they encounter something they can't deal with, Jesus goes and said, your faith is so, so small. That doesn't make sense. Are you following? It doesn't make sense to go down that route. Now, if Jesus is saying this issue that you've encountered is because unbelief is still in your hearts. It's because the faith that you have, even if it was the size of a mustard seed, would deal with this issue. The problem is unbelief. A lot of the time, their faith was not smaller than a mustard seed. And so Jesus is saying something this small can move something this big if it's on its own. I need to get this. Faith, the size of a mustard seed, can move a mountain. We love to quote that. How many of you have moved mountains? Not in a mean way. Like, I haven't yet. I've seen great things. I'm not talking about exactly about my, but there's areas of my life. There, there are healings I'm praying for. There's areas of breakthrough that I'm still contending for. Do I go that my faith has to get bigger and bigger and bigger? No. We'll talk about growing. That's different. And I'll explain in a second. But the difficulty is, it's the unbelief that's in our heart that's competing. But if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, if it's on its own in the soil of your heart, mountains will move. Nothing is impossible. The issue is, like with the disciples, unbelief is, in, is taking up too much of the soil. Unbelief is creating so much doubt in you. Are you following? Yeah, okay. Unbelief will attract more unbelief if it's not dealt with. Unbelief will attract more unbelief if it's not dealt with. It seems to be that it lets all other fears and worries and victim mentalities know, hey, there's soil here. There's never just one area that you worry about in your life. If you, don't main, if you don't actually challenge that and work on it, it seems to attract another worry and another insecurity and another fear and another self-hatred and another offense to someone else. It seems to just pile on because when it's left unattended, it attracts, it lets fears know, hey, if you can come here, plant in. They're not dealing with anything. So it was ripe here. Sometimes we make our identity the size of our problems.
be careful how you describe your problems. Because sometimes we would actually rather have sympathy from someone than receive breakthrough. Because breakthrough by its very nature leads us to take ownership and responsibility of ourselves. Went quiet. It's good though. It's true. Uh, it's true and it's challenging. And I'm going to say it again because I, I really want this seed to drop. We ha I'm not saying don't share. Okay, please understand. That is not what I'm saying. I'm not saying don't share. I'm saying be careful who you share with. Because sometimes we're just looking for our problems to get some sympathy. And our problem becomes who we are. And our worries become who we are. Oh, I can't help it. I'm like this. Oh, I, I cannot express how badly that hurts my heart. This is just who I am. I'm just a worrier. Oh, I've always been like this. Okay, it's time to change. <laughs> oh, this is, my family's like this, so yeah, I grew up like this. It's just how we operate. It becomes who we are. And then we, we, we go, okay, wow, that person is a, a man or woman, really, of faith and prayer. Yeah, I'm not going to tell them my problems because they're actually going to pray for me. Let me find someone else. Oh, we'd really, honestly, we'd rather have sympathy than someone actually, than receive breakthrough from someone of faith. Because that person won't be able to go, oh, I'm so sorry for you. Stay as you are. You won't find that in this house. You really won't. That's not us. That's not the word of God. Because straight away, breakthrough requires you to look at the soil of your heart and go, Mm, the fruit's not good. That's not on him. That's on me. I got to manage my soil. What else is going on in there? What unbelief do I have? What fears do I have? What lies am I believing? What am I not dealing with? Or I'm just skimming the top to make sure no one can see. God sees it. He knows. All right. We're going back to verse 19. <laughs> back to verse 19. This is a big lesson. Ah. Oh. I'm looking at the time. I told you I'd have to do multiple weeks. Okay. <laughs> let me uh, let me try and finish with this. I realized, it, I think it was last week that I said, let me finish with this four times. So, <laughs> so when Carl was like, babe, can I, just, can I just share? And I was like, I know, I know. So let me just try and finish with this. Okay. Verse 19. It's a very big lesson. And in a couple of weeks, I do really want to talk about what we classify as unanswered prayers. And this ties in with this. Um, it says, I'll actually do it from the Matthew version. It's the same wording. When the disciples, then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said to him, why could we not cast this out? The Mark version says that Jesus went into the house and they followed him and privately asked him, why could we not cast this out? Here's the lesson. When the disciples couldn't bring about breakthrough, they didn't create a new theology. They didn't try and justify it. They didn't try and blame anyone else. They didn't say, oh, well, I guess God didn't want to deal with this. I guess only Jesus could deal with it. No. They went to him privately and asked. Instead, they took him aside and said, why? Teach us. Show us what's happening. And Jesus was straight with them. Unbelief, guys. Let's talk about it. We don't like that when God has to calls out our unbelief. We don't like it when he brings the things to the surface that we're like, I actually have to deal with this. We don't always, I don't know. None of us enjoy being insecure. None of us enjoy feeling exposed. But in the comfort of our Father, in the private comfort of our Father, re recognize that the disciples didn't do this with the whole crowd around. They went privately in the home and exposed themselves and went, I want to know why. I'm not going to create a theology based off what I didn't see, what I didn't experience. And this is why it ties in, and I'll talk about this in a couple of weeks, it ties in so beautifully with unanswered prayers. If you're facing something, you're praying for it, you're not seeing it, 
Don't create a new theology. Go and ask him why. Because there may be things that are happening inside of you where you're like, well, I'm, I've got faith for this. Actually, your faith is being snuffed out by your unbelief in it. What did Jesus identify as the problem? Unbelief. What did the father or the son think the problem was? A demon. What did Jesus say it was? Unbelief. Ah, oh, time. Okay, I just want to touch on this very quickly, very, very quickly. Because the, his answer is important in, in the Mark version when he says, he replied, this kind come out only by prayer and fasting. And in a couple of weeks, I want to talk about prayer and fasting because I think it's very misunderstood. And actually, we kind of treat it as hunger strikes rather than like, I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to eat until you do what I want, God. That's not what fasting is. Um, <laughs> just, I want to point you, you, something out here. Jesus said that this kind only come out by prayer and fasting, Correct. But he neither prayed nor fasted, and he cast it out. I'll just leave that one there. That's just juicy right there for a couple of weeks. I'll give you a time a bit more. Prayer and fasting is to learn the authority that we carry. It's to say, I'm hungrier for something I can't see than what I can see. My faith needs to be equipped. I'm going into prayer and fasting to discover my full authority and learn how to walk in it. Jesus wasn't saying, oh, by the way, if someone comes up with a demon, go into the other room, go into the kitchen, and, don't, and just stare at food, but don't eat it for half an hour, and then you come out and you pray. No, that's not what he's saying to them. He's saying, be in my presence, fast, pray, Learn my will. Be molded. We've said this. Step onto the potter's wheel. Mo be molded. We know that Jesus prayed and fasted. At, uh, at least one time we know that Jesus fasted that it's written is the 40 days before the beginning of his ministry. Why did he do that? Because he was standing in his authority that he was given by the Father. Why are we called to pray and fast to deal with things like this? Is because unbelief doesn't get to stay in his presence. You want to deal with the unbelief in your life? You want to deal with the fears? You want to deal with the seeds that aren't of him? Get into prayer. Get before him because he will mold that thing out if you let him. He will pick that thing out in partnership. Bill shared it so well this morning. It's all about partnership. Yes, he can just deal with you. That's not what he wants to do. He wants to work with you. Second Th Thessalonians, just write down this reference. It says... Your faith is growing abundantly. So I want to be clear. When I'm saying faith isn't this about size, I'm not saying you need to have a coconut size grain of faith. That's not what he's talking about. What happens, we talked about this a while back, growth in God starts downwards. Growth with God starts downwards. It's roots. So when Paul was written to the church and he says, your faith is growing abundantly, what is he saying? That you have no unbelief? No, it's that there's space. You have cleared things out in your heart and roots are growing and they actually are being filled. So when the presence of God is in the room, that's what's being exposed. Faith grows in prayer, fueled by the word. We grow down before we grow up. Get into the word. Let it, let it expose you to his voice. Step onto the potter's wheel. Let him mold you. And above all else, I'm going to invite Carla to come up in a second to, to just lead a time of ministry. This is my prayer for each one of us, that we would be willing to deal with the seeds of unbelief in our hearts. It's never fun. I, I cannot stand on this stage and tell you that it's a fun thing to do. I won't. I'd, lie, I'd be lying to you. I discovered this personally a couple of weeks ago. Um, we've, Bill also mentioned this earlier, and it's just so important because we've talked about this when it comes to tithes and offering. Money is not the issue. It's your trust in the money over God. It's your worship of the money over God. What, money's not the issue. It's where, what, what number makes you move into unbelief or lack of trust. Well, 
I discovered my number a couple of weeks ago. I'm like, let's be honest. Needed something, had a problem, something came up, and I discovered that my unbelief came up at a certain number, and I, it was a lot lower than I thought it would be. <laughs> like, I want to be honest. I've drawn up, but you know, I was like, I've got faith for this, and I got faith for this. Well, I discovered it very quickly, actually. No, actually, at that, that number, I, I went into fear. At that number, I moved into another realm. And I had to just, and it just exposed itself in my heart. I got to deal with that thing. So I talked about it with Carla. I went, hey, babe, I found my number. <laughs> this, is, this is the amount, and now I'm in fear mode. I'm gonna, I need to deal with that. Because that's not God's promises. That's not anything I know that's in here. Did that mean that I don't have faith for finances? Uh, yes, I do. What I discovered is I need help in my unbelief as well. I do believe. The, the father of the son said, I do believe. Help me in my unbelief. We need to humble ourselves and recognize each one of us has unbelief. None of us are the finished article. I told you I was trying to finish. Um, if, if the enemy, if the devil can't get you to operate in the unbelief, he will make you blind to your unbelief. Okay, I'm going to say that again. Because <laughs> it's really key. If he can't get you to operate in unbelief, he'll make you blind to it. I meet with so many people who are like, oh, no, I've dealt with that. And I'm sat there going, you really think you have, don't you? And the nicest way, you really believe that there isn't something in there that's not good. <laughs> that that attitude really isn't happening. Or that fear, that way of talking, that way of thinking really isn't actually there. That, that, that seed isn't actually in your heart. And either you can go, everyone's just blind to themselves, or you can go, no, this is actually a tactic. If he can make you believe that you're all good, i got no unforgiveness at all possible ever in my heart. Every single person I know or have ever met, I love them so well. I'm like, do you? <laughs> like, Let's be honest about that. Do you? I, I, no matter the bill that came through my door, I would never have fear. Mm -mm. No, I have complete trust in God. doesn't matter if it's a million. I would just go, oh, thank you, Lord, for this bill. Mm. No, <laughs> let's be really honest. That's not true. I've got no insecurities. People could criticize me all day long, and I would just go to sleep happy. Would you? Would, like, genuinely? Now, yes, that's what we're working towards, but we're not there. So many of us are blinded to it. And this is his tactic. And this is why I said the word, and it's so key, it's his grace that reveals stuff in us. You could go, well, that's really mean, God, that your water of your presence exposes all the stuff in my heart. Why not just tell me the good stuff about me? Because actually it's his grace to go, hey, you need to deal with this. Hey, that th you are wonderful. You're amazing. But that attitude, it, that's not mine. I didn't give you that fear. Can you stand with me? I'm going to pray and I'm going to hand over to Carla. Um, yeah. Oh. I want you to repeat after me. And I want you to, to really just take a moment. I'm going to say it once. Think on it. And then if you really mean it, I want you to say it. And repeat. Um, Father, help me in my unbelief. That's a really powerful prayer right there, if you mean it. Father, help me in my unbelief. I do believe, I have faith, but I've got unbelief as well. I've got worries, I've had criticisms, I've got self-doubts. And those seeds, I haven't dealt with all of them. Father, help me in my unbelief. God, I pray right now for each one of us, that as we end this time, that you, by your grace, would expose in our hearts what needs to be taken out. What needs removing? 
thank you, God, because you equip us in that moment to deal with it, with, deal with it, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, God, for your grace, for your love, for your compassion. Help us with our unbelief. Help us with our unbelief. Just as we finish up, keep your eyes closed. I just felt uh, with John's message that we have to be mindful of our blind spots. And we were during communion talking about the power of unity. This is why we need people, because we can't always catch our blind spots. We are probably going to be the last ones to see it, and we might even be kicking and screaming, denying the blind spots that we have. But when we have people of God truly who live in conviction, who live in their authority, who know who they are, who know who they serve, who know how to love people, they can help us in calling out some of our blind spots. Now, not everyone has the authority and the place to do that in our life, but there are key people in our lives that we can entrust with this to say, hey, can you call out my blind spots? Because I may not always see it, but others can. And if you can see it in a way that gives me good constructive feedback, I can begin to work at it. There are times that John and I are help each other with our blind spots. And there are things that I call out in him that he just genuinely could not see and vice versa but because we know we are not looking to uh, push one another down we're looking to encourage and lift each other up to be the healthiest disciples that we can be we take that feedback as something positive to work at so lord we just thank you because blind spots are blinding god but we thank you that you can clear out the path. Thank you that you can send responsible disciples around us to help us lift us up and encourage us where we might be blinded, God. Would you help us, Lord, in, in any pride that says that we don't have anything to deal with, that we've dealt with things, God. We're not always looking for the problems, God, but we know that we live in a fallen world where things are constantly going to be thrown at us. And we don't want to be victims to life, God. We want to be in victorious living because you are victorious and that is a part of our inheritance, God. We remind ourselves and we remind our problems, our situations, our family members, our neighbors, that we are children of the Most High God. That we we walk in kingdom mindset living and that we will be victorious even amidst our challenges, our downfalls, our mistakes. Thank you because you are a forgiving, kind God and your mercy knows no end. So we just seal this time and ask you to receive all the glory and the honor for all the growth, however big or small in this season we're going to walk out, Lord. You celebrate it all, and we want to see it, and we want to celebrate it within ourselves as well, God, because you celebrate the development in us when we just are one step closer to being holy as he is holy. We love you, and we honor you with everything that we have and everything that we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless.